those sagas of valor and violence, of breakneck action and hair-raising adventure that have endured from the age of legend, three names stand out above all others. Hercules, who could strangle a wild bull or a raging lion with his bare hands. Samson, whose superhuman power enabled him to fight a hundred men single-handed. Ulysses, the reckless planner of dangerous deeds, tracking down the fabulous man-killing sea monster from the depths. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. For today's episode of Comparative Mythology, we're going to compare and contrast the story of Hercules and Samson's. Now my main sources include the Bible, Metamorphoses, and the Library of Apollodorus. The book of Judges was written down roughly around 500 to 800 BCE, and the book of Ruth that was originally part of the book of Judges was separated in 450 AD. And the Library of Apollodorus, which is the oldest collection of Greek mythology, came out roughly around the 2nd century BCE. While it's true that the Library of Apollodorus comes actually later before the Book of Judges, it seems as though that the modern day scholarly consistence is that both story draws heavily from a Middle Eastern motif. According to biblical chronology, the strongman Samson was on the scene somewhere around 100 BCE. He was most notably a biblical judge of the tribe of Dan. This tribe was divided into two main territories, one on the Mesopotamian coast, bordering the Philistines from a territory Samson held, see the map below, and on inland on Israel's northern border. And there's nothing unusual that archaeologists have discovered when it comes to the Dantane territory. It is replete with Greek influence. It shows Greek influence in household items, weaponry, burials, idolatry, etc. Coincidentally, the Greek poet Homer writes about a certain Mycelian seafaring tribe and their ship around this time participated in the Battle of Troy, a people known as Desinoian. Let's go to Judges chapter 14, verse 5 to 9. Then Samson went down with his father and his mother to Timnah. When he came to the vineyards of Timnah, suddenly a young lion warred at him. The Spirit of God rushed on him, and he tore the lion apart bare hand as white might tear apart a child. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and talked to the woman, and she pleased Samson. After a while, he returned to marry her and turned her inside to see the carcass of the lion, and there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. He scrapped into his hand and went on, eating as he went. He came into his father and his mother. He gave them some to them. When Hercules heard that, he went to Tyrone, and as he was bet by Euphrates, first Euphrates ordered him to bring the skin of the Nefarian lion, now that it was an invincible beast begotten by a typhoon. On his way to attack the lion, he came to Cleone and lodged at the house of the day laborer, Mulacres, and when his host would offer him a victim in sacrifice, Hercules told him to wait for 30 days and then, if he had rescue safe from the hunt, to sacrifice the savior Zeus, but if he was dead, to sacrifice him as to a hero. And having to come to Nibia and track the lion, he first shot an arrow at him, but he perceived that the beast was invulnerable. He hurled his club and made after him. And when the lion took refuge in a cave with two monks, Hercules built up the one entrance and came upon the beast through the other, and putting his arm around his neck, held tight until he choked it. By then he was very thirsty and called upon the Lord, saying, You have granted this great victory by the hand of your servant. Am I now to die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? So God split open the hollow piece that is at Lehi, and water came from it. When he drank, his spirit returned, and he was revived. Yesterday came a man most fell and wanton violence, most grim in form, and his eyes flashed beneath his swallowing bow. A ruthless wrench, and he was a chat in the skin of a monstrous lion of a raw hide, untamed, and he bare a steady bow of olive and a bow, whereas he shot and killed his monster here. So he too came as one traversing the land on foot, patched with sturge, and he rushed wildly through the spot, searching for water, but nowhere he would like to see it. 
Now here he stood a rock near the Trojan lake and of his own device, or by propping some god, he smote it below his foot, and the water gashed out in full flow. Then Delilah said to Samson, You have mocked me and told me lies. Please tell me how you could be bound. He said to her, If they blind me with new robes that have not been used, then I shall become weak and be like everyone else. Then Delilah said to Samson, Until now you mock me and tell me lies. Tell me how you could be bound. He said to her, If you weave the locks on my head with the web and make it tight with the pen, then I become weak and be like everyone else. Then he said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me three times now, and I have not told you what makes your strength so great. Finally, she nagged him with her words day after day and pestered him. He was tired to death. So he told his whole secret and said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for now it has been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, then my strength would leave me. I would become weak and be like everyone else. So what happened to Hercules according to Metamorphosis? A number of years went by, and the fame of Hercules' deeds had spread through the world and imbued his stepmother Juno with hatred. Icalia conquered, he now was about to fulfill his vows at Jupiter's temple on Cape Sinium, when chattering rumor hurried ahead and reached the ears of Deianira, rumor whose joy it is to embroider the truth with falsehood and grows by her lies to gigantic proportions from tiny beginnings. Amphitryon's son is burning with love for Princess Iole. Hercules' wife believed what she heard. The thought of a rival filled her with dread. At first the poor woman indulged her distress in a deluge of weeping, but later she asked herself, What is the point? These tears will only give Iole pleasure. What's more, she will shortly be here. I must therefore make haste and think of a plan while I may, before my place in my husband's bed has been fully usurped. Should I say how I feel or be silent? Stay here or return to Caledon? Leave my own house? Or at least put up some show of resistance? Perhaps I had best remember my brother, the brave Meliager, and strike out boldly. Why shouldn't I show how deadly an injured woman's resentment can be by cutting this concubine's throat? She considered a number of different plans, but the one she preferred was to send her husband a shirt which was stained with the blood of the centaur Nessus in hope of regaining Hercules' faltering love. Unaware what sorrow the tunic would bring her, she gave it to Lycas, a servant who knew as little as she did, with honeyed instructions to offer this gift to her husband. Her husband in innocence took it, and vested himself in the shirt which the hydra's venom had poisoned. The fires had been lit, and now he was offering incense, uttering prayers and pouring libations of wine on the marble altar. The poisoned shirt was exposed to the heat, and its power was released by the flames to creep on its cancerous way through Hercules' body. So long as he could, he suppressed his groans like the hero he was, but after endurance was conquered by pain, he pushed the whole altar over and filled Mount Eta's forests with terrible cries. He struggled at once to tear the lethal robe from his shoulders, but where it yielded, it tore at his skin. Revolting to detail, it either stuck to his limbs as he tried in vain to remove it, or else it exposed the bleeding flesh and the massive bones. Even his blood gave a hiss, like the sound of a plate of hot metal plunged into icy water and boiled in the fire of the poison. The greedy flames relentlessly sucked deep into his vitals. Black droplets of sweat exuded and trickled all over his body. The charring tendons crackled and snapped. The invisible canker melted the marrow inside his bones. Then he raised his hands to the stars and cried, Now feast on my ruin! Saturnian Juno, feast, cruel goddess. Look down from above on this scene of destruction and glut the desires of your brutal heart. Or else, if my plight cries out to be pitied even by you, my inveterate enemy, racked as I am by harrowing torture, relieve me of life, 
the life that I hate, the life that was destined for nothing but labors. Death will now be a boon and a worthy gift from my stepmother. Was it for this that I mastered Busiris, who fouled his temples with strangers' blood, that I stole from the violent giant Antaeus the strength that his mother, the earth, supplied? That three-bodied Geryon, three-headed Cerberus, failed to unnerve me? And was it for this that my hands were able to break the horns of the Cretan bull, that I cleansed the Orgean stables and shot the Stymphalian birds, that I caught the deer of Diana in Mount Parthenius forests, stole Hippolyta's golden belt by the river Thermodon, and captured the apple so closely watched by the sleepless dragon? Was it for this that I conquered the centaurs, and overpowered the boar which was wasting Arcadia's fields, that even the hydra gained nothing by growing two heads to replace each one she had lost. Remember, too, that as soon as I saw Diomedes' horses fattened on human blood with their mangers cluttered with mangled corpses, I slaughtered them all and destroyed their master beside them. Mine are the hands which crushed the life from the lion of Nemea, Mine is the head which supported the sky, yes. Jove's cruel wife must be weary of setting me tasks, while I am not weary of doing them. Now I am faced with a new affliction, which cannot be conquered by courage or all of the weapons I own. A devouring fire is roaming the depths of my lungs and consuming the whole of my body. Eurystheus, though, is alive and well. Can anyone still believe that the gods exist? So speaking, Hercules stumbled in agony over Mount Eater's heights, like a wounded bull with a hunting spear in its back when the frightened assailant has fled. Imagine the hero constantly groaning and constantly roaring, constantly trying in vain to tear every stitch of his garments away from his body, uprooting the tree trunks, or venting his anger against the mountains, or stretching his arms to his father's domain. There was Lycus cowering down in the niche of a rock. When Hercules saw him, he shouted with all the fury his torment could muster, Lycus, did you deliver this present of death? Will you be my killer? The servant was trembling and white with fear and said a few nervous words in excuse. But while he was speaking and on the point of throwing his arms round Hercules' knees, the hero grabbed hold of him, whirled him round several times, and tossed him into the sea of Euboea with greater force than a catapult. As Lycas fell through the air, his body started to harden. They say that the rain, when condensed by the icy blasts of the wind, is turned into snow and the soft light substance of swirling flakes is later congealed and frozen hard into pellets of hail. That is what happened to Lycas, according to ancient tradition. When tossed through the void by those powerful arms, he was bloodless with terror and drained of all moisture. So thus he was changed into solid stone. Even today, in the Sea of Euboea, a low rock rises out of the waves with an outline that hints at the form of a man. Sailors are frightened to step on this rock, as though it could feel. And the name they give it is Lycas. But what then happened to Hercules? Felling some of the trees on the heights of Eta, he built them into a pyre, and to set it alight he employed Philoctetes. To him he entrusted his famous bow and the quiver containing the arrows destined one day to revisit the kingdom of Troy. And while the flames were licking the sides of the funeral pyre, Hercules covered the piled-up wood with the skin of the Lion of Nemea, then laid himself down on the pyre with his club for a pillow, smiling, as if he were gently reclining a guest at a banquet, crowned with a garland and quaffing the unmixed juice of the vineyard. The flames were rising, spreading all round and crackling loudly, licking away at the limbs of the hero, who calmly awaited a foe he despised. The gods were afraid for the earth's great champion, 
But Jupiter, <laughs> sensing their fear and beaming with pure satisfaction, grandly addressed them. You gods, this anxiety of yours is a pleasure to me. I offer myself wholehearted congratulations that I should be called the father and king of a people that cares, that a son of mine should be also supported by your good wishes. This support is a tribute, I'm sure, to his own magnificent exploits, but I am myself in your debt. Now, truly, my faithful subjects, you mustn't be needlessly frightened. Ignore those flames on Mount Eta. The hero who conquered all will conquer the fire you are watching. Vulcan's power will only affect the part he derives from his mother's side. The part he derives from me is eternal. It cannot be touched by death and is fully resistant to fire. This part, when its time on Earth is complete, will be welcomed by me to the realms of the sky, and I trust this action of mine will give pleasure to all of the gods. But if any among you by chance is against the admission of Hercules here as a god, he may grudge the reward, but will know it was richly deserved and grant his reluctant approval. The gods were all in agreement. Even his royal consort appeared to be happy, except for her one black look of annoyance on Jupiter's final words when he'd singled her out for a black mark. Meanwhile, all that the flames could ravage had been disposed of by Vulcan. Hercules' body no longer survived in a form which others could recognize. Every feature he owed to his mother had gone, and he only preserved the marks of his father, Jupiter. Just as a snake, which has shed old age with its sloughed-off skin, will frolic in youthful freshness, its new scales brilliantly glinting, so when the hero of Tyrins discarded his mortal frame, he gathered strength in his better endowment. He grew in stature, and now was invested with majesty, weight, and an awesome authority. Jove, his almighty father, swept him up through the hollow clouds in his four-horse chariot, home to the glittering stars. Now the lord of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to the god Dagon and to rejoice, for they said, Our god has given Sansom our enemies into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their god, for they said, Our god has given our enemies into our hand, the survivor of our country who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, Call Samson and let him entertain us. So they called Samson out of prison, and he performed for them. He made him stand between the pillars, and Samson said to the attendant who held him by hand, Let me fill the pillars on which the house rests, so I may lean against them. Now the house was full of men and women. All the lords of the Philistines were there, and on the roof there were about three thousand men and women who looked while Samson performed. Then Samson called to the Lord and said, Lord God, remember me, and strengthen me only this once, O God, so that this one act of revenge I may take back the Philistines with my two eyes. And Samson grabbed the two middle pillars on which the house rested, and he leaned his weight against them, his right hand on the one and the left on the other. Then Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. He strangled with all his might, and the house fell on the lords and the people who were in it. So he killed on his death, there were more than those that he killed during his life. He kinkled his all his family came down, and took them brought up, and buried them with the Zorah and Israel in the tomb of his father, and he judged Israel twenty years. One final example comes directly from the story called Nagal and Arishagal. When Nagal heard this, he took up an axe up to his hand. He drew the sword from his belt. He went down to the forest of the Mizi trees and cut down many different trees. Nagal set his face towards Nikagi, to the dark house, to the house which those enter cannot leave. On the road where traveling is the only way, to the house where those who enter are deprived of light. Where dust is their food, clay is their bread, they are clothed like birds with feathers, they see no lights, they dwell in darkness, they moan like doves. 
The gatekeeper opened his mouth and addressed his words to Nagao. I must take back a report about the god standing at the door. The main reason why I brought up that particular story is because according to the glossary for the myths of Mesopotamia, that the character Nagao may have been pronounced as Hercules in Greek. What do you guys think about the similarities between Samson and Hercules? Tell me in the comment section down below. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Because black friends are rare, as you should be aware. He smiles like Richard Pryor, so just sit and stare. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler.